Well, it was quite soon after I'd arrived in Sri Lanka, or as it was then called Ceylon, as Canadian High Commissioner in 1960, that uh, we had an opportunity to visit Jaffna in the north of the island. And uh, we'd arranged an appointment with Yoga Swami and uh, I went to the door of his little hut and knocked on the door and he was expecting me and he said, is that the Canadian High Commissioner? And I said, no, Swami, it's not, that's what I do, it's not what I am. And he laughed uproariously, just wonderful laugh. And he said, then come and sit with me. <laughs> and I did, and that was the beginning. Already from that moment, I felt bonded with him. And that was his uh, tremendous gift to be able to cut through everything conventional and uh, make a contact being to being in that way, immediately. Not too much talk about it. He knew we were coming because uh, one of his disciples was the brother of a dear friend of mine in the Gurdjieff work, uh, James Ramsbottom, who was later Lord Solbury. And um, he had arranged the meeting for us and um, we had uh, both Ramsbottom and I had, had, had many Gurdjieff family connections uh, through Madame, de Hart, Ma Madame uh, Spensky in New Jersey. That's a daunting comparison to try to make. Uh, and I don't feel qualified to do so, but just my subjective impressions. As you say, both of them were very adept at feeling the inner connection with another person, the spiritual connection, and addressing that rather than the mental associations that are the ordinary form of intercourse between people. But I think the characteristic of Gurdjieff's way uh, and perhaps Yoga Swami's too, I don't know if you'd agree. It was not just a work in a monastery or a work in an ashram. It was a work in life. It had to be taken uh, not just to a cushion, but from the cushion into ordinary exchanges and daily life. So that in a way for Gurdjieff, ordinary life be becomes your teacher. What happens and your ability to respond to it freshly and not just 
by association, thinking about it, or by emotional reaction, like or dislike. But a more direct, intuitive connection that is subtle and not everybody has it naturally, or at least it's not very well developed in most people naturally, but it can be. And as a spiritual practice, I think this was important. And Yoga Swami, I felt, was approaching it in the same way. I remember uh, how he would uh, uh, deal with people who were trying to make notes of what he was saying or take photographs of him or use these means of trying to get at what he was indicating as a path. That's what I was remembering. He actually said to somebody, in Jaffna, uh, who was going round scribbling after what he was saying. And he was saying, the next thing you're going to do is collect my spit. <laughs> <laughs> to distinguish that the energy of presence, which he was trying to transmit, was not to be captured in words or thoughts or anything that could be reduced to an association or a reaction. But how to come to it fresh? And you, you spoke yourself just earlier today about how he would roar at you. And I'll tell you a story about uh, what he said to me about that, roaring. He was not called a, a lion for nothing. I'd been on a round-the-world trip with my wife. Uh, we'd uh, been in Australia and, and New Zealand, Hawaii, and back through uh, uh, America to, to Sri Lanka. And when he sat me down beside him in Jaffna, he just started right in on me, saying, what do you think you're doing, jumping around the world like that and wasting your energy? What a waste. Why don't you sit quietly and say, who am I? I. Who am I? Who am I? <laughs> and that's a mind stopper. That's an association stopper. You can really be silent. with that energy and feel it, know it in a way that the mind in its associations never can know. Now, both Gurdjieff and Yoga Swami, as I see them, were 
extraordinary beings helping humanity to make a turning point. A turning point that if it isn't made, may lead to our extinction, perhaps. It's very critical now. A spiritual crisis underlying all the other forms of crisis, economic, political, social, you name it. But underneath all that, this crisis in how a human being behaves, is, who we are, the understanding of that at this time has become crucial. I felt he was taking traditional forms, the Mahavakya, for example, Summa Iru. Summa Iru, just be quiet, just be. The words of St. John, I am is the way, the truth, and the life. And Yogaswami, quoting from the beginning of St. John so often, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, that, that pointer to a reality that is one, and beyond Hindu, beyond Christian, beyond Sufi, I've had wonderful teachers from each of these traditions. And we're all gradually coming to this crucial understanding of the need of a human being for a direct contact with that reality. And that's the most important thing we're here for. Perhaps we're designed for that in the first place. One time I, I took uh, not only my wife but my three children uh, to see Yoga Swami and Jaffna. And um, we all sat down in front of him on the floor of his hut. And he looked at each of the children and said to the youngest, who is my daughter, how old are you? And she said, I'm nine. And then he put the same question to the two boys, and they said, I'm 11, and I'm 13. And each time they spoke, Yoga Swami looked at them in the eye and said, I'm the same age. And by the time he'd said this three times, my youngest one protested and said, you can't be the three different ages at once. <laughs> and he laughed and laughed and winked at us <laughs> and didn't say anything more to explain it. But you see now what he was laying down in them, that later on, each of us remembering that incident could begin to see that there is something, not just in Yoga Swami, but in each human being that is the same age, that is timeless, that is not just the body that dies. 
and he wasn't going to explain all that, that was our responsibility to figure it out and to understand it, to live it. But it was a wonderful way of teaching. Frustrating for people probably, but wonderful. Yeah. Did the children come to terms with that? They have now. <laughs> they have now. Each of them has spiritual practice. And um, I think it had an effect on them. And I remember we had teachings, as I was saying earlier, through his German Swami disciple, Garibala. And I was very struck by Garibala's story, uh, as the children were too, of how he first met Swami when he decided it was all pointless and he'd been through Buddhism and Hinduism and he hadn't got anywhere and the war was over and he was just going to go back to Germany. And he was taking a last look in the Jaffna bookstore to see what to take back with him. And this white-bearded, white-headed figure appeared in the window of the bookstore and shouted at Garibala, it's not in books, and then disappeared. By the time he got to the window, no say. So that was what set Garibala looking for him, and he found him later that day and never left him. <laughs> it was the way he had of connecting. Not explaining so much as a being connection established. I think that's the important thing. And this is the most subtle. We're so educated to think about it and there's something much more direct that we can learn to experience. When we begin to call it presence, is that just a word or is it an energy? Is it a is it a reality that uh, we're all learning to approach as human beings now? Garibala was full of Kumaraswami and Geno and traditional uh, teachings, as well as uh, Yoga Swami. And that's what we mostly got when we were on tour with him. We went, for example, to Arunachalam, to the Ramle Maharshi Monastery. Uh, after the Maharishi had died, and uh, there were stories about him that reminded me of Yoga Swami. <laughs> Maharishi, uh, Ma Ramana Maharshi, saying uh, to one of his pupils that. Oh yes, I go up and down every day. There's an elevator, you know. 
Top of the mountain, down again. <laughs> and of course, we're all in this uh, mobile state of never being quite sure where we are, but somewhere between the bottom and the top. <laughs> but gradually becoming convinced that there is one reality underlying all that we see and touch and know in the ordinary way. As I remember him now, I see Yoga Swami as sitting mostly, just as you're sitting, crossed leg on the floor, uh, very upright, straight back, and uh, very free in his movements. Even though he was old, I suppose, by then he was in his 80s. Uh, and uh, yet he had the freedom to manifest an energy whenever he wanted and however he wanted. He was not just reacting to circumstances, but he was a conscious presence. I mean conscious of himself at the same time, conscious of what it was in him that animated this force. And that was a kind of contagious experience because he was right there, present. I could be present with him at that moment. I was riding his wave. And that was his help to me at that time. I had a reference point that by myself I could come back to remember and return. Yes, that's possible. I've been there. I know. I am. Suma <laughs> Yeru. No small talk, no conventional, how are you today, what are you doing, how's the family, <laughs> forget it. We're not here for that, we're here to serve God. And I feel both Yoga Swami and Gurdjieff were helping humanity to understand God in a new way. And Yoga Swami could do this quoting to me St. John's Gospel because I was from the Christian tradition or quoting uh, from the Upanishads or the Tamil sacred writings and poetry. Uh, but it was the energy that was important to experience. And the words were just the vehicle for that energy.
and never to be taken literally. Because all forms are a trap. I don't think he ever said that to me, or to anybody I heard, but, but I felt that he was free in that sense of the trap that we're all the rest of us at our lower level uh, inevitably are, are caught in, a conditioning, our education, our genetic inheritance, all point us towards forms of behavior that are pretty automatic. And he was not automatic, he was free. I haven't met many people in my life about whom I could say that. Whenever we're present, we're happy, surely. There is joy in being, joy in this uh, connection with a reality that is vivifying. I don't know how I can put it more. Just to remember him makes me smile <laughs> because it brings uh, something of his uh, Joie de vivre, <laughs> uh, one could say, sort of a, a force of nature uh, that is more than nature. We did have some silent times, but not very, not very much. Um, there was always the pressure of other people waiting to get in to see him and so on. <laughs> um, but usually those were people at the door outside waiting for us to leave, uh, not um, sharing in the experience of his presence at the moment. Yes, there were people around who were always there to get in. And um, one never knew uh, when one would be uh, accepted. There is not even one thing wrong. Epibo modindakarya, something. I'm trying to remember these uh, words. It's really an astonishing affirmation uh, at a time when uh, things are obviously not going all that well. <laughs> and yet, behind that, this feeling that he emanated 
that the nature of reality is benevolent and orderly and intelligent and good. That, 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 uh, that's a point of view that can sustain one through any kind of adversity or suffering that may arise. And uh, it only comes by having oneself an experience of the goodness that underlies everything we see as disorder and, and chaos. <laughs> what are the other Mahavakya? It was all finished long ago. Long, it was finished long ago, yeah. <laughs> Perfected long ago, you know? Finished? Finished is one translation. Nam Hari Om. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Nam Hari Om. We don't know. Yes. To know so much that you don't know. <laughs> yes. You see, that too, uh, Gurdjieff was teaching. That what we know or think we know, is really getting in the way of our sensitivity to the unknown. That we have it all figured out, so uh, we're not looking for anything beyond that. We're in our little box, comfortably, <laughs> asleep. <laughs> yes, this question between doing and being. All our education and our whole culture is stressing, oh yes, get busy, do it, learn how to do it, and the being, we're not taught. <laughs> it's something we don't understand the meaning of the word in our culture. And what a pity, because everything that could be on the road to freedom, presence, depends on that uh, beingness. Gurdjieff called God the being of beings. <laughs> Yoga Swami said Siva was the life of our life. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> same thing. Light, again, light is very much... Uh, spoken of in, in uh, uh, Kharjif uh, in the inside teaching, you see, not in the books. Mm. But it's no good making it another idea. It has to be experienced. I feel uh, indebted to Yoga Swami, uh, as you can see, for uh, what he gave me. And um, 
everybody who knew him was uh, changed. My friend, uh, Lord Solbury, uh, became a, a farmer, <laughs> as you know, uh, on Swami's orders for a while. Um, and Gurdjieff, um, when the most famous uh, literary critic in England, Orage, uh, joined him at the Priory, uh, Gurdjieff put him to work digging ditches for a long time, two weeks, three weeks. And finally one day he said, well, enough, let's have coffee. <laughs> And they could talk. But there were not just tests, but to see you could use the body and experience something while doing that, while in action, in life that was not the same as, as sitting on a cushion. However necessary that is to prepare. Since we're embedded in this uh, materialistic and secular culture uh, that is uh, really going downhill pretty fast uh, as we can all see I think the best one can hope from a, any great teacher is that by the grace of his presence, one has a moment uh, echoing that presence in oneself to give you a taste of what it's like to be free, to be awake. And these moments, when they accumulate over time and are nurtured by one's own practice, can lead to a more sustained sense of presence than one could ever come to by oneself. That's how grace flows. And uh, it really does flow. It's a fluid, as it were, an energy, just a vibration in the absolute echoing through creation, as it were. So, any form that any teaching takes is always a deviation, <laughs> inevitably. And again, we have to come back to find this formless uh, experience of what it is that uh, 
has been the source of it all. And if that source is both imminent and transcendent, as I think all the teachings say it is, then I am is a faint echo of The Big Bang, I am. <laughs> the singularity. Unity. Perhaps the only thing one can do is try and maintain the purity of a teaching that one has received and not let it get uh, diverted and distorted by all the surrounding influences that are so strong. And in a way, uh, this contest of forces that seems to be taking place, I don't know if you have the impression, as I do, that when the negative downpulling forces are strong, at exactly at the time when the evolving up going forces have to be strong to balance and are. So these two are part of one process. Absolutely. And uh, we realize that the obvious increase of negativity, but we're not so easily aware of the increase of positivity. One of the uh, Canadian Torontonian writers uh, who is a journalist by profession Tom Harper is the he writes on spiritual matters for the Toronto Star and um, since we have a large Buddhist and a large Hindu population in Toronto uh, he writes also about these traditions and, and uh, is making the point that uh, we're just seeing at the popular level uh, the cliches of other traditions and not their essence at all. Yes. Uh, and I think it's time we broke through that uh, to realize that we're all human beings, that there is really only one search. <laughs> and one goal. One goal. One of the best uh, contemporary scientists, uh, physicists, is Lee Smolin. He's uh, on front page of the New York Times and all that sort of stuff. And he told me, we've been friends for years, he told me not long ago, <coughs> he said, physicists have been scared stiff of consciousness. We daren't touch it. <laughs> we don't know what it is. But they want to know. <laughs> and he's writing a book about time and consulting me about what I understand <laughs> on time. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's very encouraging that uh, the, the cognitive scientists the Dalai Lama's been working with, too, have been discovering at Harvard and, and other universities that the neuroplasticity of the brain 
that everything one thinks changes the structure right. of the brain. Right. We're beginning to understand, even the scientific community, that um, a quiet mind can lower the crime rate, <laughs> all that. <laughs> Uh, there are consequences that are measurable and uh, we're only just beginning to explore in science what the spiritual traditions have known for thousands of years. That we're all totally interconnected. <laughs> 